I believe the children are dismissed for uh, junior church. <laughs> All right, well, since the beginning of human history, people have been fascinated with the end of the world. I myself have been in this camp as well. When I was a sophomore in high school, as the school year was ending, a classmate of mine began to speak about an upcoming date, June 6, 2006. Or as you can put it up on the screen like this, 06, 06, 06. And I distinctly remember being in English class and the teacher allowing this young lady to get up there and speak, and she mentioned how 666 was the number associated with the beast from the book of Revelation and how this upcoming date she was really scared because there is lots of death and destruction to come and that she was praying really hard that this date wouldn't be the end of the world even though she thought it might very well be so. And I remember hearing about that and being anxious and nervous and well thankfully this day came and went and the world did not end. And then about six years later at the early part of 2012 I learned about the prediction of the ancient Mayans who said that at the end of that year, on December 21st, that the world would again come to an end. And I had just recently put my faith in Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior about three months before, and so I didn't really understand how a Christian should react to these discussions. I didn't know how I should respond to that Mayan prediction about the end of the world, and so I started to do some research, and I went on to YouTube to do all of my research, which is a really bad idea just <laughs> in general. And I got caught up watching video after video for hours and hours and then days and, and like weeks and weeks. And a lot of these theories that they came up with were, some were good, one was good. It said that the earth was going to enter into a new era of prosperity and that everyone was going to be rich. And I thought, wow, this sounds awesome. Like, this is the best depiction of the end of the world. Ever, But then the other videos and the other theories said things that were much worse. One video said that the earth and the planets and the sun would all align so perfectly in that day that the atmospheric pressure would be so great here on earth that anyone who was above ground, they would feel all that pressure in their brains and their blood vessels would burst and that would lead to the mass extinction of the human race. Other theories said that aliens were going to invade or that there was a massive planet known as Planet X which was on its way to hit the Earth and that scientists knew all about it and yet they were told by governments all around the world to keep quiet. The one theory that I really got caught up in said that on this date uh, that an EMP burst would hit the Earth, that's an electromagnetic pulse, and that it would plunge the Earth back to the dark ages and we would all be living in a time of no electricity and so I started to really get involved in this theory and I said wow I need to figure out how to survive an EMP burst and so I went through and I did my research and I drew by hand how to uh, keep and maintain and build my own irrigation and farming system complete with all these schematics of all the tools that I needed which is kind of shocking looking back because I'm about the least handy person you will ever meet in your life. Just like six months ago, I was trying to put windshield wipers on my car, and it was slightly raining outside, and I was out there for like an hour, and I came inside, and I told my wife, I said, this is impossible to do. And so with the car, and she was like, let me try, and she was in and out in like, like five minutes. And she was recently pregnant at that time, she still uh, was able to do it. Well, thankfully, December 21st, 2012 came and went, and my farming skills were not put to the test, my irrigation building skills were not put to the test, and the world did not end. But reading about these dates, reading about these different predictions, it wasn't exactly calming to my soul. And if we look to the future, there are many dates that people are going to again say that the world will end. To think about the end of all of this, of everything that you know, can be rather unsettling. To see depictions of it doesn't really help to calm our fears much. I just went on to Google and typed in images about the end of the world, and these are some that came up. These don't exactly make you feel good, and we've all seen a disaster film or two in our lifetimes, and when we go, man, this day looks awful. <coughs> Biblically speaking, this day, a day that scripture will call Judgment Day, or the Day of the Lord, is a terrifying day. The prophet Zephaniah says this about that day. He says, a day of wrath is that day, a day of distress and anguish, a day of ruin and devastation, a day of darkness and gloom, a day of clouds and thick darkness. 
a day of trumpet blast and battle cry against the fortified city and against the lofty battlements. None of these words make you feel good. None of them make you feel awesome. This is not a rosy picture that is painted. And so, without a proper understanding of this day, without understanding how we as Christians should respond to it, it's easy to be afraid. Because here's the truth. This world is really going to end one day. We are closer today to an ending than at any other point in human history. But here is the greater truth. If you are a Christian, if you have truly put your faith in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, then you don't have to be afraid and you don't have to be anxious. You don't have to fear the day of judgment and the destruction that our Bible says is coming because on this day, out of all the other days, is the time when you should feel the most secure and where you should feel the most safety due to your faith. You see, there is salvation on the day of judgment, and it is for believers in Jesus Christ. And we can find a great example of this, of salvation on the day of judgment, when we look at the story of the fall of Jericho in our Old Testament. If you are unfamiliar with the background to the story, here it is. The Israelites have just completed their wilderness wandering of 40 years, and now they have a new commander who is leading them, a man by the name of Joshua, and they cross the Jordan River, right there, and as they cross, they are coming to a place called Jericho. And so God has so orchestrated everything that the army of Israel, the people of Israel, they are going to enter into their promised land with a perfect opportunity to split that land in the middle and to split it in two. They are going to be able to strike at the heart of their enemy, and the heart of their enemy is Jericho. Jericho is an extremely important city. It controlled major migration and trade routes all around. Not only that, but it was considered to be the strongest military outpost in the surrounding area. You see, if Israel can take Jericho, if they can destroy this stronghold here, then they will be able to strike fear into the hearts of all of their enemies. This is what you would call psychological warfare. Destroy the enemy's strongest point first, and the rest of them will cower before you. But Jericho is a great military establishment due to its walls. In the book of Deuteronomy, Moses describes the walls of Jericho as being part of cities great and fortified up to heaven. Jericho is a massive obstacle, and as the Israelites approached, they would have seen what you see here on the screen. They would have come up and they would have seen that first wall there, which is on your right, and that wall went anywhere from 30 to 40 feet up off the ground, and then once they got over that wall, they would have had to go up another hill, and then you have that top wall there, which is about 20 feet in height, and so this is what the Israelites are facing as they come to Jericho. So what I want to do this morning is I want to read the text in Joshua chapter 6 in its entirety, and then I want to backtrack as we zoom in on some key parts of this passage so that we can truly see that there is salvation on the day of judgment. So we're going to read through. It might take a few minutes. I'm just asking that you would bear with me. And we're going to start in verse 1 of chapter 6. Here's what it says. It says, Now Jericho was shut up inside and outside because of the people of Israel. None went out and none came in. And the Lord said to Joshua, See, I have given Jericho into your hand with its king and mighty men of valor. You shall march around the city, all the men of war going around the city once. Thus you shall do for six days. Seven priests shall bear seven trumpets of ram's horns before the ark. On the seventh day you shall march around the city seven times, and the priests shall blow the trumpets. And when they make a long blast with the ram's horn, when you hear the sound of the trumpet, then all the people shall shout with a great shout and the wall of the city will fall down flat, and the people shall go up, everyone straight before him. So Joshua the son of Nun called the priests and said to them, Take up the ark of the covenant, and let seven priests bear seven trumpets of ram's horns before the ark of the Lord. <clears throat> and he said to the people, Go forward, march around the city, and let the armed men pass on before the ark of the Lord. And just as Joshua commanded the people, the seven priests bearing the seven trumpets of ram's horns before the Lord went forward, blowing the trumpets with the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord following them, 
the armed men were walking before the priests who were blowing the trumpets, and the rear guard was walking after the ark while the trumpets blew continually. But Joshua commanded the people, You shall not shout or make your voice heard, neither shall any word go out of your mouth until the day I tell you to shout. Then you shall shout. So he caused the ark of the Lord to circle the city, going about at once, and they came into the camp and spent the night in the camp. Then Joshua rose early in the morning, and the priests took up the ark of the Lord. And the seven priests bearing these seven trumpets of ram's horns, before the ark of the Lord walked on, and they blew the trumpets continually, and the armed men were walking before them, and the rear guard was walking after the ark of the Lord, while the trumpets blew continually. And the second day, they marched around the city once and returned into the camp. So they did for six days. On the seventh day, they rose early at the dawn of day and marched around the city in the same manner seven times. And at the seventh time, when the priests had blown the trumpets, Joshua said to the people, Shout, for the Lord has given you the city, and the city and all that is within it shall be devoted to the Lord for destruction. Only Rahab the prostitute and all who are with her in her house shall live, because she hid the messengers whom we sent. But you keep yourselves from the things devoted to destruction, lest when you have devoted them, you take any of the devoted things and make the camp of Israel a thing for destruction and bring trouble upon it. But all silver and gold and every vessel of bronze and iron are holy to the Lord. They shall go into the treasury of the Lord. So the people shouted, and the trumpets were blown. As soon as the people heard the sound of the trumpet, the people shouted a great shout, and the wall fell down flat, so that the people went up into the city, every man straight before him, and they captured the city. Then they devoted all the city to destruction, both men and women, young and old, oxen, sheep, and donkeys, with the edge of the sword. But to the two men who had spied out the land, Joshua said, Go into the prostitute's house and bring out from there the woman and all who belong to her as you swore to her. So the young men who had been spies went and brought out Rahab and her father and mother and brothers and all who belonged to her. And they brought all her relatives and put them outside the camp of Israel. And they burned the city with fire and everything in it, only the silver and gold and vessels of bronze and iron they put into the treasury of the house of the Lord. But Rahab the prostitute and her father's household and all who belonged to her, Joshua saved alive. And she has lived in Israel to this day because she hid the messengers whom Joshua sent to spy out Jericho. Now, before we take apart the text, I think it's important for us this morning to just make sure that we do not misapply this story. You see, it's very easy to take the story of Jericho and to make it all about you. And it's easy to look at this text and to say something like, well, what is your Jericho? What is your promise? What relationship walls do you have in your life? What financial walls are stopping you from reaching your <clears throat> dreams? What emotional walls do you have? And while I don't think that's a heretical way of teaching the text, I do think that it misses the main point here. There's also a, another very popular way of misapplying this text to our lives, and it's to look at the action that you are to take. You see, in this story, the Israelites have walked in a circle around the city of Jericho, and so one of the extremely popular ways of misapplying this story is to say that the story of Jericho is teaching us that we need to walk in circles around what it is that we are praying for. One of the greatest selling Christian books of the last few years is a book called The Circle Maker, which as of 2016 had sold over a million copies. And the book claims that walking in circles, and I mean literal circles, I mean walking in circles, is a great way to get God to answer your prayers. And the book looks at this story and says, look, these people walked in circles and God gave them what they wanted, and so you need to do the same. And then the book asks the question, what are you walking in circles for? What dreams can you walk around? What promises are you circling? Circle your promise, walk around it, and God will give you whatever you want. I don't think I really need to go in how many problems there are with this line of teaching. The notion that you could walk in circles as some 
formula to get God to give you whatever it is you <coughs> desire is complete nonsense. The point of the story of Jericho is not that there are obstacles in your life that you need to walk in circles around what you desire. The point of the passage before us this morning, the way that this story can apply to us today, is that it provides us with assurance that there is safety and there is salvation on the day of judgment. You see, the greatest tragedy of the misapplication of this text is that it takes the focus off of Jesus Christ and the glorious truth of his saving gospel. See, the gospel says that all of us have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. The gospel says that there is only one way to inherit eternal life, and that is by putting your faith in Christ alone. The gospel says that Jesus Christ came and he died and he paid the complete and sufficient sacrifice for your sins on the cross and that he rose three days later from the grave. And the gospel then calls us to go and worship him as Christ and Lord, because he has saved us. That we talk frequently in Christianity about being saved, and the question is, well, what are we saved from? And the truth is that we are saved from the wrath and the judgment of God. As one pastor put it, he said, we are saved by God, from God. And so it's important for us as Christians to put the focus on the gospel of Jesus Christ, to lift him up, for us to look at how salvation plays out in this passage, and it's important to be reminded that when the world all around us seems to be going crazy, and when we read stories of impending nuclear war and of economic turmoil and of government cover-up, and where the world seems to be getting worse and worse, we don't have to fear. We have a solid rock on which we stand. You see, the gospel is found in Joshua chapter 6. We just need to know what the gospel is. And so as we look at this story again, I think it's helpful to break it up into three parts. The first is that judgment comes to Jericho. The second is the sound of the war cry. And the third is the way to be saved. So let's go through point one, judgment comes to Jericho. Verse one tells us this, it says, now Jericho was shut up inside and outside because of the people of Israel. None went out, and none came in. See, the army of Israel is now encamped all around the gates of this city. The people inside Jericho, they are scared. They don't want to face this army out in the open field, and so they retreat. You see, the people in Jericho had heard of the people of Israel. They had heard of those who worship a God who parted the Red Sea and who destroyed neighboring kings. We learn in Joshua chapter 2 that the people in Jericho melted away when they heard what God had done for Israel. And Joshua 2 takes place just a few months before Joshua 6 here. So in Joshua 2, the people of Jericho were free, but Israel is still far away. They are miles and miles away, and yet now they are right outside their city gates. They have come to their doorstep. Their greatest fear has now been faced. They are face to face with the people of God. And I want you to think about a time where you have had to face a great fear. You know, when I was a kid, and uh, I remember reading about the ocean, and uh, I learned about tsunamis and tidal waves in school, and I remember seeing movie clips about ships going out into the ocean and then being tossed back and forth. I remember looking at that stuff and thinking, wow, the ocean is really powerful. And then it kind of slipped in from my mind. See, I can't really swim, and so I don't really go to the ocean. And I should really say that I... I really can't swim, like at all. I go into the water and I just sink. And so, I'm not a beach guy, right? I try my best to stay away. I live in America, I don't have to go to the beach if I don't want to. Right? <laughs> and then one summer though, when I was 13 years old, I went on a cruise with my family. And let me tell you, when I was 13, and I don't know if any of the uh, men in the room can, can relate, but when I was 13 years old, there came a point in that process where I really felt like I was indestructible, right? And it didn't matter that I was five foot two, 110 pounds. Any man, beast, or force of nature that got in my way, I was going to be able to conquer it. Nothing could stop me. And I remember feeling like that until the first night of being on the cruise where I went up to that top deck and I looked out at the ocean and I saw all blackness all around me and you could hear the waves 
raging, and you could see nothing for miles and miles. And I felt so small in that moment because here was this massive force all around me, and it was much more powerful than I was. And I retreated back to my room, and, but any rocking or shaking, it had my mind racing back to everything I knew about that ocean, back to how, how powerful it was. And that moment was sobering, to say the least. And I thank God that for me there was an end to that. That cruise ship graciously ended. I've been able to stay on dry land ever since, and I have no desire to ever go on cruise <laughs> ever again. You see, I had it out from that moment. But there's no out here in our text this morning. The Israelites are all around the city. The people of Jericho, they can't run away. And so the people of Jericho put their trust in their walls. Their, those walls had most likely protected them in the past, and they were hoping that they would do the same thing again. But as we know, walls are no obstacle for the living God. It's like a scrawny little teenager trying to hold back the power of the ocean. That's the situation inside the walls of Jericho. Now, if you were on the outside of the walls of Jericho, that would mean that you were in the army of Israel. And if you were one of the soldiers there, your mind would immediately go to, okay, how can we go and take this city? And there's really two logical options that come up. The first is that you just attack. You go full force and all out war. And you may suffer some casualties, but the hope is that you'll be able, able to overwhelm your enemy. Or the second approach that you can take is that you simply wait, and you wait out your enemy. See, Jericho can't be shut up inside and out forever. Eventually, those city gates are going to have to open. Eventually, they are, are going to need supplies. It might take a month. It might take months. It might take a year. But eventually, you could just wait them out. And while those might be solid human plans with a solid military strategy, this is not what the Lord has the people do. See, the Lord's plans are not like the plans of men. Verses 2 and 5 tell us this. It says, And the Lord said to Joshua, See, I have given Jericho into your hand with its king and mighty men of valor. You shall march around the city, all the men of war going around the city once. Thus shall you do for six days. Seven priests shall bear seven trumpets of ram's horns before the ark. On the seventh day you shall march around the city seven times, and the priests shall blow the trumpets. And when they make a long blast with the ram's horn, and when you hear the sound of the trumpet, then all the people shall shout with a great shout, and the wall of the city will fall down flat, and the people shall go up, everyone straight before him. As James Montgomery Boyce says when remarking on these verses, he says, to a human point of view, nothing could have been more useless when faced with the complete and utter monstrosity of these walls. High walls do not yield to the noise of trampling feet. Cities are not won and conquered by trumpets, and yet that's exactly what God has called Joshua to do here, and Joshua obeys. Joshua is to lead his army in a march around the city, once a day for six days, and on the seventh day, they are to go around that city seven times. Verses 6 to 14 of our passage then show us how Joshua relays this message to the priests in the army, and they listen, and they obey what he has said, and they march around the city on days 2 to 6. And then verses 15 to 20 recount for us what happened on that seventh day, where Joshua tells the people what they are to do. The walls fall down, and the army of Israel is to go inside into Jericho and devote everything there to destruction. And then verse 21 shows us the culmination of this judgment on Jericho. And it says this. It says, Then they devoted all in the city to destruction, both men and women, young and old, oxen, sheep, and donkeys, with the edge of the sword. We are told in this story that the Israelites suffered no casualties. They had no injuries. It was a complete destruction on the enemies of God. Now, the question for us is, why is that okay? Why did Jericho need to be destroyed? See, this text here, this verse specifically, is a text that's used by unbelievers to try to make the point that the God of your Old Testament is a vindictive figure, and they throw out words like tyrant, and they throw out words like genocide, and they compare what God did here to what Adolf Hitler did in the final solution. 
So why is this okay? How do we respond to that? Well, it's important to realize that the people who lived in the city of Jericho, they were known as Canaanites, and even by ancient standards, the Canaanites were a detestable people. They practiced all sorts of sexual immorality with people of whatever age. They were into witchcraft and wizardry, and on top of that, they engaged in child sacrifice, not just for infants who were just born, but for children up to the age of four. Can you imagine sacrificing your child after they can call you mommy and daddy? And that's the type of stuff that the Canaanites were engaged in. And they did these detestable practices for over 400 years. For 400 years, the Lord was patient with these people. For 400 years, he allowed them to seek after the knowledge of him. Their immorality was incredible, and God stayed his anger against them. See, the great danger with the Canaanites is that their kind of evil and immorality often influence societies who are already evil and immoral to be even much more so. And this type of thinking, the Canaanite way of living, their ideology, eventually managed to trickle its way into the people of God. If you read in your Old Testament about how kings sacrificed their children, you go through and you go, oh wow, it comes back to the Canaanites. So our first point comes to its conclusion. Jericho has met a great force. Judgment day has come to them. The clock has struck midnight. Both their men and their women, their old and their young, have met the edge of the sword. The judgment on Jericho was complete and it was total. And it was no less and it was no more than the people deserved <coughs> due to their rampant sin. Our second point this morning is the sound and the war cry. When the army of God went into Jericho, verse 20 tells us this. So the people shouted and the trumpets were blown. As soon as the people heard the sound of the trumpet, the people shouted a great shout. This symbol of the trumpet sounding in our Bibles is actually a pretty big deal. The trumpet sound is meant to signify two very important things. The first is the coming of the day of the Lord. We see this here, and we also see it in the book of Joel, chapter 1. Where it says this, it says, Blow a trumpet in Zion, sound an alarm on my holy mountain. Let all the inhabitants of the land tremble, for the day of the Lord is coming. It is near. The second thing that the trumpet sound is meant to symbolize is God marching with his army out to war. In the book of Zechariah, a scene is described where the uh, pagan nations and their armies are lined up against the army of God. And then we read in Zechariah chapter 9, where it says this, it says, Then the Lord will appear over them, and his arrow will go forth like lightning. The Lord God will sound the trumpet and will march forth in the whirlwinds of the south. And these two ideas of the coming of the day of the Lord and God marching with his army out to war, they merge in our New Testament, where the Apostle Paul writes in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, he says this, says, for the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a cry of command, with the voice of an archangel, and with the sound of the trumpet of God. The word used here for a cry of command is the Greek word kelesma. And it means a war cry. So at the sound of the trumpet, there is a war cry, and the Lord himself descended from heaven. As one commentator said, he said, you only give this type of war cry if you have an army you are leading. And here it is the Lord Jesus Christ himself who is leading this army, and they are marching out to war. Now, at Jericho, at the sound of the trumpet, the people shouted, and then the text tells us this, that the wall fell down flat so that the people went up into the city, every man straight before him, and they captured the city. You see, the Lord made it easy for his army to enter into Jericho. He doesn't even make them sift through the rubble or walk over rocks. He doesn't even make them turn. The walls fell down flat, and the army of God is able to walk straight in and attack what amounts to easy prey for them. And I want to suggest to you this morning that you and I are currently living in a place that is very similar to Jericho. I mean, look around at the world. 
Look around at the complete rebellion against anything holy and sacred. Turn on the TV and see the sexual immorality seemingly everywhere. Think of the rampant social ills that our world has, things like abortion, corruption, and poverty. See, we may not be sacrificing our children after they are born, but we sure are doing it before they are born. Think of the blatant use of horoscopes that people put their trust in to govern their lives, where it seems like you encounter more people who believe and entrust their zodiac signs rather than a Bible. And think of the false religions that you see in every town you visit, and the desire by many in positions of power to slander and despise the God of creation, to defame his holy word, to attack it as untrue, or to twist it for their own benefit. Think of all of these, and there are many more evils that you know of, things that I haven't even said, things that you know that I don't, and God's wrath is being stored up against it. And yes, the Lord is patient, and yes, he is long-suffering, but eventually the clock will run out on this world, just like it did on Jericho. You see, the armies of the Lord are currently circling Jericho, and by saying that, I mean our planet. And they are just quietly waiting for the right time, and the walls of this world will fall down, and Jesus Christ, the commander of the army of the Lord, he will give his battle cry, and the trumpet will sound, and he will descend with his army behind him, and he will have total victory. We would be wise to recognize that what we see in the story of Jericho is a miracle. When we read our Bibles, the miracles that we encounter are tiny pictures here of a greater reality to come. So when Christ was here, he healed, he raised the dead, he cleansed lepers. It will be even greater when he comes to restore all things. And this circling and this decimation of Jericho is saying something similar to us. When Christ comes to restore all things, the Bible makes it clear he will completely and utterly destroy anything that stands in his way. Now, if the story stopped there, then this is bad news because the Bible makes clear all of us deserve God's wrath. All of us deserve to be punished on account of our sin. All of us, at least in at least at one point, we're standing in the way of God. And when Jericho fell, everyone was judged according to their sin, except for one family. And that's when we come to our third point this morning, which is this, the way to be saved. Verse 17 of Joshua 6 says this. It says, And the city and all that is within it shall be devoted to the Lord for destruction. Only Rahab the prostitute and all who are with her in her house shall live, because she hid the messengers whom we sent. See, everything and everyone in the city is to be destroyed except for Rahab, because she hid the messengers whom the army of God sent. Now the question is, why did she do that? It's here that we need to go back to Joshua chapter 2, because in Joshua chapter 2, we get a fuller picture of Rahab. See, Rahab was a Gentile. She had no allegiance to Israel. She was not born into Israel. She was born outside of the family of God, kind of like you, kind of like me. And before God gave his war plan to Joshua on how to attack Jericho, Joshua sent two men into the city of Jericho to go and spy out the land. And the king of Jericho comes to an understanding that these two spies have entered into his city, and he comes to learn that they went to Rahab, the prostitute's house, and so he sends for her. And these, and these men from the king go, and they knock on her door, and they ask her a question. They say, are these two men here? And, and Rahab says to, them, says to those men, she says, they're not here. They, they left. And she says this while she's hiding the people of Israel, the two men from Israel, on the roof of her house. And then we get to the main part of her story, which is found in Joshua 2, verses 9 to 11. This is what she says to the men whom she hid. She says, I know that the Lord has given you the land, and that the fear of you has fallen upon us, and that all the inhabitants of the land melt away before you. For we have heard how the Lord dried up the water of the Red Sea before you when you came out of Egypt. And what you did to the two kings of the Amorites who were beyond the Jordan to Sihon and Og, whom you devoted to destruction. And as soon as we heard it, our hearts melted, 
and there was no spirit left in any man because of you. For the Lord your God, he is God, in the heavens above and on the earth beneath. Rahab gives a profession of faith, and she has a knowledge that the Lord is God in the heavens above and on the earth beneath. So that's why she hides the spies. That's why she didn't rat them out to the king. You see, before the walls of Jericho fell, Rahab was living in the city of Jericho, but she was living as one who had put her faith in the Lord. She was in the city, but she was no longer of that city. She was now a part of a different city. She was a part of a different kingdom. <clears throat> and sure, she would have had to go through the day-to-day -day errands of living in that city, and she would have had to gaze upon the sin of her neighbors, and she would have had to struggle with sin herself. But can you imagine what it must have been like for her to know that the armies of the Lord were coming and they were just outside of her walls? Can you imagine what it must have been like for her to know that every sinful thing that she looked upon would eventually be met with a just payment? And while everyone in Jericho was holding out the tiniest bit of hope that those walls would provide them with safety, Rahab would have known that those walls could do nothing to stop a God who parted the Red Sea. And just in case Rahab had any doubt that her faith would not be rewarded, just in case she was afraid that the people of God would forget about her, we come to verses 24 and 25. It says this, And they, that's the army of God, burned the city with fire and everything in it. Only the silver and gold and the vessels of bronze and iron they put into the treasury of the house of the Lord. But Rahab the prostitute in her father's household and all who belonged to her, Joshua saved alive. See, Joshua spared Rahab and her family. There was no forgetting about her. What a kind act Joshua did. And yet, if you look at the text just a little closer, something pops out, something that makes you go, Whoa, this is pretty cool to see. See, you can't go through the life of Joshua without mentioning this key point here, that the name Joshua in Hebrew means God saves, and his name is pronounced Yeshua. And the name Jesus in Hebrew is also pronounced Yeshua. So if we are reading this text in Hebrew in the original language that the text was written in, if you were reading this text as a recent convert from Judaism into Christianity, into Christianity, you would have read that highlighted part on the screen right there, and you would have stopped, and you would have marveled at what the Word of God says, because the text would literally say something like this, but Rahab the prostitute, and her father's household, and all who belong to her, Yeshua saved a lot. It was Yeshua who saved Rahab and her family. In one sense, it was Joshua who did this, and yet in a much greater and meaningful sense, it was Jesus who did this. That's the gospel message in this story. See, we can only be saved from the judgment to come by putting our faith in Jesus Christ, and it is He who saves us. And the truth is that when your judgment day comes, whether Christ returns here or you go to meet Him there, you will be as safe as Rahab. She was in those very walls that fell down flat, and she made it safely out of the judgment. If God can save this woman, if God can save this Rahab, who was a Gentile and a harlot, and who was so obviously breaking the law of God, then he can save you. And if God has saved you, the great news is that you get to dwell with him. You are not separated from him, but rather you are drawn near. The text continues, and it says this, and she has lived in Israel to this day because she hid the messengers whom Joshua sent to spy out Jericho. Not only was Rahab spared on the day of judgment, but she was able to live among the people of God. You see, it would have been an amazing example of grace for Joshua to say, I've spared you, but now you've got to go out and do your own thing. You are not allowed to be with us. You are, I, you are dirty and you are filthy. You can't be with us, but that's not what happened. She is given provision to live in Israel. She is given a place. And her story becomes so great because eventually we see that Rahab is in the genealogy of the Messiah, 
that woman who was so unworthy, that woman who was so looked down upon by society, that is the one who was so loved by Christ that she would be in the bloodline of our Savior. Hebrews 11.31 says it like this. It says, By faith Rahab the prostitute did not perish with those who were disobedient because she had given a friendly welcome to the spies. You see, it is by faith that Rahab did not perish, and it's by faith that you and I will not perish either. You see, there is salvation on the day of judgment, and it is for you, and it is for me. But that's only true if you have put your faith in Jesus Christ. If you have wholeheartedly trusted in Him for your salvation, if that's true, then you will be safe when you face your judgment. You won't have anything to fear on that day. Let's pray again. <clears throat>